Greetings, ladies and metal gents, and welcome to this latest narration of the web series There is No Epic Lucia, Molly Puns. If you are new to the series, there is a playlist listed down below in the description. And as always, I hope that you enjoy. Chapter 190 Delta, the Last Earbender. Now, Klaus, Mr. Jones began, his lecturer in Ferris Bar was an odd choice. But Delta Polani took a seat between Dio and some child that looked like she could be the star of her own young teen romance novel with silver hair. The kids at Durance were a little odd. Still, Delta was just happy she wasn't going to explode in a violent death anymore, so she was a little giddy just to enjoy the lesson. Mr. Jones asked, What effects does Dungeon Manor have on demons? And Dio shot his hand up. It gives them wings so they can fight for the justice of the powers of Dio, he said eagerly. No, that's characters in a book you've read, Dio, Mr. Jones corrected. Delta suddenly had an idea to bring all the children down to the library. With a dungeon control, she could even thin the manor to prevent any incidents. Well, in churches, demons will sweat badly. In some lawyer offices, they also sweat, but differently. A memster, a quiet child with a strange light and dark manner or a scent. So, uh, maybe they could have a cold sweat here? He shrugged. Ruli raised her hand seriously. Yeah, I bet you they just get fat, Poppy said, and Ruli's hand began to wave, desperately to be called on. No, Dungeon Manor must be a delicacy. I bet demons, even Mr. Jones, are getting outrageously drunk on the manor. Drinking like they have demons to drown, Grimm said as his tongue sparked orange while he spoke, causing a stream to rise into the air. I actually have robots right here, Farrah grunted as she slammed a tray of sandwiches and soda drinks down for the kids. Then she handed Mr. Jones a smoking goblet of vaguely screamed in terror. Rudy was so far out of her chair, waving her hand in the air, that she was straining with her neck muscles pulsing with all her effort. Miss Darkness, Bane, Mr. Jones asked with a smile. No effect. Demons and dungeons work on different wavelengths. Their energies pass through each other. She gasped and she sagged down into the seat at the table right beside her before she sought a smug grin at the teens around her. I see the newest crop of Mr. Jones' torture sessions aren't up to snuff, she bragged as the next to her, a goblin shot her a dirty look. Swan the fire mage snorted at her. As a grown woman, that's just sad. Rudy just ignored him as she sat there with a smile. Do you know why? Mr. Jones asked innocently, and Rudy stiffened, quickly busying herself with drowning three beers in one go. I have no clue either, Delta muttered, feeling like she should know this one as half of the subject in question. Not to fear, it is a bit of a rather obscure metaphysics, Mr. Jones said, as the pub door slammed open with a dramatic flare, and a breeze fluttered through the bar, making the candles flicker. Obscure metaphysics is my thing, Yatina said with a smile as she looked around the bar. Delta blinked, having been too focused on Mr. Jones to even notice her approach. She smiled at the woman, having forgotten only Rudy and Mr. Jones would be able to see her. Yatina paused and looked where Delta sat with a wink and a new golden eye, as if she was trying to focus on something, but was distracted as she joined Mr. Jones at the bar. Delta blinked. That had been weird of Yatina. Ah, oh, I heard some fair play possessed a modicum of smart. I welcome you to this discussion and give you a chance to answer the question you heard while lurking behind the door, eavesdropping before you made your entrance. Mr. Jones smiled and Yatina sputtered before waving him off. I was not lurking, I was merely preparing for a lull in the conversation, she corrected. Yatina cleared her throat. Demons are beings devoid of what we humans would call a soul or essence of humanity. They likely existed long before we even appeared in this world. Dungeons take the natural world energy, aka mana, and take the essence of human souls, combining them into something uniquely their own. Demons can interact with us humans, and vice versa, sort of like water in a trench, empty and something with content. Yutina explained as she noticed she was losing the more classroom challenge students. Rudy was beginning to drool as her eyes rolled up in her head, and her brain was shut off. Demons are rocks, humans are water, and dungeons are gas. People can, over time, interact with dungeons and be disturbed by demons. Dungeons and demons just can't interact with each other, she summed up. Mr. Jones is drinking right now, Grimm said, pointing out the issue with Yatina's words. Delta could feel the demon drinking, taking in her manner and doing something with it. That's physical interaction, we're talking about manner. Dungeons cannot contract pure demons, and demons cannot take the souls of dungeons, Yatina said, as if the subject was fascinating, and Delta leaned in on her hand, enjoying her passion. Except, there was one little issue. It was a duck-shaped issue. 
Dalton had contracted a demon. She let her mind wander over to Waddles, who stared right back. The contract between them had barely done anything to the duck, unlike what it was doing to Remy and Jack. In fact, Waddles held up a bond between them, showing how easily he could break it, but chose not to. The form he was in was technically duck-shaped, but it was a mana construct. It was one of Quiss's accidents, so maybe that allowed for a loophole. In fact, Mr. Joe's and Runelik were also mana constructs. Delta just hadn't noticed because they were also so tightly woven together that it was like a real body. The more Delta actually paid attention to them, the more they began to feel off. She took a slight peek at her dungeon self. In an instant, Mr. Jones was gone, replaced by three-headed mass of tendrils connected to exposed reins, each brain connected to a dozen eyes and a mess of pulsing veins carved with glowing symbols. The eyes moved in every direction, as if constantly reading something Delta couldn't see. The creature was bound with cords and chains, with a single lock that had no keyhole, but a missing word. Runelix swarm had also changed into a being of ashen scars. His mighty hands blackened by a fire so hot they would have melted anyone else. Every bang of his hammer caused his bones to flash like a reaction of lightning. As he breathed, smog and bone dust wheezed out like an old tomb. His fire was barely a flicker, but it was an inferno all the same. He was also bound by chains, but these chains were much darker, as if made of shadows and silence. Almost a little afraid, Delta turned to look at Rudy. Trudy, looking at the woman for the first time, and saw that she was mostly the same, except that her horns and the darker skin mixed with glowing lines of fire. Her hair was more smoke than thread, but it was still life-loving Rudy. All the same, Delta had contracted Waddles. What made Delta different? You keep forgetting how annoyingly human you are. Dungeon 2.0, now with anxiety pre-installed, Lou said as he appeared with a flicker, as if she was sensing her concerns. I only screamed in panic once or twice, she argued, as Yutina went on to describe how some species of life had odd reactions to demons. Spiders, mushroom spitters, people, mushrooms, new listed. Reasonable responses, Delta said confidently. Pygmy, mushrooms, Remy, maestro, Bob, he kept going. You make it sound unreasonable, Delta said, pointing at the screen with a glare. Wilhelm Muffet, your secret garden results, hero in action, Jack Shrine, Jack's death, the gargoyles, he said having no shame. I didn't scream at my critter mounds when I attacked Maharia, Delta said, smirking, as if this made her the victor. Death, star, dragon, Nu said with a jab with each word. Delta stared back defiantly. I left the oven on, she said through clenched teeth. And that is why dungeons seem to talk to themselves, Mr. Jones said, as he gestured to where Delta was sitting. Wait, what? Now I want to see New, Dio said excitedly. The rest of the class spoke up as Yatina was squinting hard to where New floated. I would rather teach pygmies the art of love and pacifism than ever let one of these urchins bathe in my glory, New said in horror. Delta didn't want New to have all the glory, but why was her body, her avatar, still too flimsy to be seen by normal people? Why? Why couldn't she just be manifest? She focused, straining as her face turned red, and she grunted. Fists clenched as she stood with her legs apart, her voice beginning to climb into a primal yell. She was focusing her energy on pumping everything she had into the efforts, like she had three episodes to burn through in screen time. Delta felt her manner gather like a storm, filling her with a dramatic passion and an urge to defy all natural order. It felt a lot like eating cake in bed, delicious but risky. There was a feeling of her ears popping as she felt a little weighty. Delta's vision began to spin for a moment, but she was sure she had managed it. She had produced a physical avatar. Sir, an ear just appeared on the table and it's bright orange, someone screamed. Delta suddenly noticed her entire being was a left ear, detached from everything else. I would give you an earful, but I would risk actually smothering you, Lou said. She was thinking that it was weird to have eyesight as an ear. Delta tried to speak, but all she did was manage to vibrate her malleus and Inca's bones in annoyance. Class, we just witnessed a first-time avatar attempt. Please write a report on this event that's between 500 and 50,000 words, Mr. Jones said excitedly. Delta tried to let go of being physical, but all she managed to do was flop once and make someone panic in a high-pitched scream. It's eerie, Grim wailed, and Delta grinned and would have shot him a thumbs up if she had thumbs. Listen, Rudy began, then shot Delta a wince. Sorry, he's <laughs> just slipped out, she promised. Before she gently picked Delta up and Farah appeared with a broom, ready to fight anyone that looked to have ill intentions towards Delta or a piercing gun. 
I have heard and seen dungeons take smaller steps. Some do birds or fish before they go four-legged, then better. Straight to human might be well. This, Moody explained, and Delta wished that she could hug the woman. Start small. Delta should have guessed that. Well, she couldn't quite figure out how to let go of the Avatar state, but she could still muddle with it. She focused and tried to think small. What was small, cute, and her? Delta had to be something more than a worm. Would they still love Delta if she was a worm? She just had to go with what felt natural and simple. The simplest thing she had ever eaten was water, rocks, some wood, and gut rots. Gut rots were actually very simple. They were made up entirely of hatred and despair. Even now, the taste. Her ear form began to bubble and glow with an orange light. Rudy stared down at the glowing mushroom that was bathing in the room in orange light as it formed slowly, opening up two milky white eyes and a tear near its cap. Delta, she asked slowly, and the mushroom began to wail with a deep sound of misery that slowly turned into a maddening scream of rage. Before the mushroom could let out a scream of curses, Pharaoh put a jar over Delta's avatar, muting the flailing mushroom that seemed to be making some very suggestive actions of vengeance and tearing apart the very idea of God until he weeps and fades into the darkest recesses of terrified non-believers, like the deity never believed in arriving at their doorstep, bloodied and scarred. Rudy blinked and eyed her Delta surprise drink that she'd been given. It made her feel all educated from the nicest facility, as if she'd boarded with the upper crusts in their establishments of finery. Indubitably, she cheered. Nope, this is worse than second time around, Estelle said from the corner of the bar. Three bottles of wine kept her company. Remarkable. She has the purest markings of any cutrot I've ever seen. She must love them and have studied them so well, Edina muttered in awe as she stared at Delta. That's not infatuation, my lady of the cold facts, Rudy said with a grin, her tone amusing and noble now. That is mild case of absolute loathing, she explained. I think she looks pretty, Dio said, smiling as he leaned up close to the jar. Delta paused in a cursing to coo at Dio before looking defeated. Then the gut rot form popped like a soap bubble and she was gone. I can't protest that thine form is more pleasing to my sight than you are yourself, Lady Delta. I enjoy your sick manner existence, I cannot deny. Rudy nodded to Delta as she reformed in a dungeon state, invisible to most. What? Delta asked. It's that refreshing drink. It makes me sound like I married my cousin for the money, Rudy winked. You should marry for love because love is infinite while money is finite unless you're a bad person, Leo said wisely. I'd sell you for a copper coin, Grim said with a snort and Dio smiled at him. I can give you money, he said brightly. Rudy felt at peace. It was odd, but it was the truth. The scene with these people. Rudy liked it. She was just missing her enemy, Chris, so that they could drink and complain about people. Oh, and also her fishing rod. So why did she feel like something was coming, out of the sight but rapidly approaching? The town's layout is nonsense. The twists lead to dead ends, but the dead ends open out into intersections when we turn around. There's a bakery next to a building that looks haunted, but the bakery smells so good. The bank accepts blood as money, and we've passed the same hat shop four times, but it's never the same place. Soma heaved, her eyes darting about the street that they were on, as if expecting a wild animal to appear. Mass gave her a worried look as he adjusted his free top hat he got from the said hat shop. Mass just happened to be the first customer in a decade. Sima also couldn't remember what the owner of the store looked like, or when they actually went inside the store. But they all had hats. Her sun hat was tailored perfectly and rather comfy, which Sima tried to take solace in. Should we ask for directions? Mass asked as he held Mule, the slime fast asleep like a toddler. Soma followed his eyes to a store that was entirely void of color and paintings of little characters with round figures, and a bouncy appearance smiled out at them with goofy-looking large gloves. They looked cute, but there was something about their state, the way that they looked seconds from moving when Soma's eyes moved away from their frames that made the hair stick up on the back of their neck. One of the frames was almost leaking, as if the concept of art and immortal existence was oozing into their reality. It was horrifying. He was coming. He was... Let's try over there, Lawson suggested quickly, and pushed Sermat towards the store, where a cheerful woman that smelled like wet soil after fresh rain chatted to an old man with a gap-toothed smile and a selection of cheeses on a tray. Hello, the woman said and mass waved. Nearby Imp had stood to talk to the monstrous inky monster coming out of the frame like old friends. 
Don't look, don't look, Summer ordered herself. She had come to win at the local dungeon and returned to rip her father's bony grip from the throne and shove him into one of the grandmother's golden torture devices they kept in the attic. Summer didn't have time for the strangeness. Heldy, this is Summer, Lorsa said as she was using that same tone when speaking with Mayor Darkness. Haldi didn't seem to be listening as he beamed at them. The old man had a gentle soul, and Surma instantly liked him. She didn't even mind the overwhelming smell of cheese. It felt more like a charming quality than anything bad. There was never any cheese at home. Her father had something against dairy products. Have some cheese of the right arm. It's limited in sauce due to the disease, but it is delicious, he offered snacks to her and mass. Surma's soul melted when she ate the offered snack, and she tried not to float off with a feeling of bliss as Mass just beamed. Cheese. Selma would wear a suit of this cheese when she locked her father in the Golden Maiden. You smell of nobility, the woman said. Her smile a little less bright, but no less kind. Y yes, apologies, Selma said, blushing as she forgot her manners. I am Princess Selma of the capital city. She did a polite bow. R royalty, the woman said. Her smile trembling as she turned stiffly like her legs were made of wood. I must be going. I left an excuse to leave on the stove, she said numbly and walked off quickly. Haldi waved her off and sighed. Don't take it personally. She and royals have history, Haldi explained with a tilt of his head, making his snow-white hair move in the breeze. Was it my father or my grandmother, Soma sighed, feeling a headache coming on. Surprisingly, it had little to do with them and a much older kingdom called Turtog, he said quietly, and Surma had never heard of it. She needed to brush up on her geopolitical knowledge, or she'd miss things like this. It was an older kingdom that caused a powerful distortion by committing a deep wound on the world. A lot happened, but due to a lot of drain on the land, it became a grey zone. How they continued to explain and the elder was definitely knowledgeable for a cheesemonger. Where is it? Selma asked, interested as Mass was given more snacks to enjoy my Haldi. Oh, around. Uh, it collapsed, but uh, the wound never quite sealed over, Haldi said vaguely. Their kingdom doesn't just collapse. There'd be ruins and signs of their history, Selma pointed out as Lorsa snorted at the idea of something lasting. She was such a cynic. Well, sure, if the collapse was done by decay and time, but there is a different way to collapse, Haldi said, then peered at her. Summer looked back, unwilling to blink. You remind me of someone. They had the same sort of reasoning about things, and your nose is awfully familiar. Haldi mused and Summer was going to start wearing a veil. The nose business was giving her a complex. You knew her father, Lorsa said slowly. Haldi continued to stare and Summer raised an eyebrow. I know a lot of noble fathers, Haldi said oddly. They suck, Soma said bluntly, and Haldi staggered suddenly as if he struck by a memory. I was informed I had an escort question. Someone spoke up, and Soma turned, blinking as she saw a sort of familiar face. Aren't you Perhal's apprentice? She asked, and the boy with stoic look gave her a look as if only noticing her. I retired, he said slowly. You must be Alpha, Lorsa said quickly and the boy shot her a look, hand on his sword suddenly. You're, he said, and Lorsa was at his side, giving his shoulder a squeeze. Royal Knight Captain Lorsa, I'm glad you remember, she said with a wink. Delta is better, Alpha said, and Lorsa made a strange choking noise as Alpha turned to Soma, but Mass stood between them. Please be nice, Mass said, and Alpha frowned. My moral agreement is irrelevant for this escort quest. If it was, it would be listed before I accepted it, he said, and looked at Soma. I'm here to take you to Delta. Do you have any objections, and are you able to match my walking speed without pathing issues? He asked seriously. This is not how one escorts a lady, Soma said with a little bit of royal tightness in her voice. Your class is princess and rebel. You're not a lady, Alpha pointed out, and Soma's nostrils flared. I'm about to class change to murderer in a second, Soma said as she tried to square up to Alpha, but Mass held her back. Think of blood on your nice dress, Mass said, and Soma hesitated. The dress has no enchantments or law. It's mid at best, Alpha continued to speak. Do you have a problem with me? Summer asked, and Alpha suddenly made a strange smile. Heard a royal ruler must be advised by their head mage. I'm simply trying to be helpful by pointing out that the dress you're wearing has no protections built into it, nor does it allow you to activate any seduction skills to gain political power over your enemies, he said flatly. 
I'm about to seduce your ribcage into a meat grinder, Soma's eyes flashed. Alfred frowned, and Soma mentally felt like it had won a point in his strange game. I do not find you attractive as a ruler or as a girl. I'm simply advising you of your shortcomings as to prevent you from dying or committing an act so shameful that the royal city collapses. Also, my ribcage would break most meat grinders, as I have thick bones passive ability. It gives me thick bones, he added, as if Surma needed a clarification. Like a thick skull? Surma asked, voice sickeningly sweet. Yes, I can headbutt most things without an issue. Sometimes if I use it on trees, a creature will fall out, he said, ignoring a tone that just made Surma feel worse. Princess, he's just bad at talking, Mass said quickly, and Surma was going to introduce him to some rudimentary social classes in the, in the nearest blood arena. Perhaps Surma would feel better, Alpha, if you shared a weakness you possessed, Haldi suggested over the noise of the argument, but the old man was grinning. Alpha frowned and seemed to think, and think, and think some more. Humility, perhaps, Surma whispered. I could not wear a bad dress like the princess, Surma can, with confidence. I think a weakness of mine is this confidence, he said, and Surma went for his throat. Youth is the best cheese of all, Haldi said brightly, and Lawson could only nod over the sounds of Surma's fingers, creaking, as they tried to squeeze Alpha's throat, but doing little more than causing indents in his skin. Your choking skills need to be grinded. I'll add it to the list. Surma was going to leave this town with the ability to crush metal with her bare hands, even if it killed her. Mass can help her, Lawson said quickly. I don't want to be choked. Give it time, Lawson said, and Surma's urge to strangle them all grew. A blonde man with a peacekeeper badge turned the corner, took one look at them and pivoted on his heel and walked back the way he came. Harder, use your thumb more, Alpha instructed. Surma was seeing red and a little gold. End of chapter. I would just quickly like to thank the T5 peeps. Dragon Soup, Cold War Boomer Waffen, Severin Cerberus, Red Panda 121, Leslie 517, Bushmaster 177, Casper Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Sans the Skeleton, Lightjock, Dragzoon WRE, and Lord Azrakal. Thank you very much.